All right, as Pat just stated today, we, uh, scripture reading is from the book of Joshua, chapter 22, verses 1 through 4, and then 10 through 31. Because I'm old, I need glasses. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I've commanded you. You've not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. And when they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad, the, tri the half-tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. And the people of Israel heard it, and they said, Behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. And then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and with him ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them the head of a family among the clans of Israel. And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, and they said to them, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this breach of faith that you've committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor, from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves, and for which there came a plague upon the co congregation of the Lord, that you too must turn away this day from following the Lord? And if you too rebel against the Lord today, then tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. But now, if the land of your possession is unclean, Pass over into the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or make us rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. <clears throat> Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of the devoted things and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel and he did not perish alone for his iniquity. Then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, The mighty one, God the Lord, the mighty one, God the Lord, he knows. And let Israel itself know, if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so to burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. No, but we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord. So your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you and between our generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings. So your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. And we thought, if this should be said to us or to our descendants in time to come, we should say, 
Behold, the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offering, or sacrifice, other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. When Phinehas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh spoke, it was good in their eyes. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh, today... We know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. Thank you, Brenda, for reading uh, the word of the Lord. Man, we are, uh, this, I'm loving this, this book and it's got so many lessons and today is gonna be a very practical lesson that we all need, right? Now, I heard about a 76-year-old man, a grandfather, actually, uh, who was in London, and he got married, and there was something uh, that was different, a twist to his wedding, though. He ended up marrying, now, you're gonna have to follow me on this, okay? It's very soap opera-ish, in a way. He ended up marrying his granddaughter's husband's mother, okay? Which made things, as you can imagine, a little weird for his granddaughter, right? So, uh, for instance, his, his, her grandfather now was her stepfather-in-law. Her mom was now her sister-in-law. Her brother was her nephew. And uh, really, what's crazy is she was now married to her uncle and her kids were now her cousins. I mean, this is like a Christmas family Christmas party in Kentucky, right? I mean, it's just, man, it's there. And so, I mean, you thought your family was weird, right? Now, here, here's the point of the, the story. Uh, relationships are messy right? They're messy, but they're vital to life-giving relationship. They're vital to, to value in life. But the problem is, is we live in this disposable world where everything is disposable. I mean, in some things, it's not bad. I mean, think of the styles that have come and gone. Think of the rat tail, for instance, the pop collar for the guys. You remember when guys used to wear the pop collar or the rat tail or the Jinko jeans or, you know, velour track suits or shutter shades, all, all those styles that you think, man, I am so glad they were only here for a cup of coffee and moved on, right? I mean, things are disposable, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what that has translated over into is our relationships. And as a result, what you see is most marriages last about as long as a new car, uh, and most friendships last about as long as a Kardashian marriage, right, a wedding. And so, so uh, you know, things are disposable, and including our relationships, and we move on, and what that does is it prevents us from going deep and having roots, the relational roots that give us life. And so uh, that's what I think this passage, this chapter is so good uh, as all passages in the Bible, but this one really has some deep principles for relationships, for life-giving relationships that we need to hear today, okay, that we need to apply today. And that's what we see when we look at, 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 this, uh, uh, at this chapter. Now, uh, we need to, to remember uh, the setting of what's going on here uh, before we dive into the points that I think this pulls out. One, remember that uh, the, the two and a half tribes, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, as you read, we read today, they, with Moses, before Moses died, Moses was still leading, they had asked Moses, hey, when we go into the promised land, they were on this side of the Jordan, when we cross the Jordan, when we go into the promised land and we win the war, the Lord gives us this, this land as God has promised. You're gonna divide up the land. Would you please give us the land on this side of the Jordan? They wanted the land in Moab where they were camped with Joshua before they went across the river. They wanted that land and they're getting ready. They're on the, they're on the precipice. I mean, they're, they're right on the border of the promised land and before they go over, they're asking Moses, can we just have this land? Moses got angry, if you'll remember, because he remembered how the spies went into the land and come back and he sent 12, uh, they come back, 10 of them were negative. We can't take the land. It's too, the, the people are too big. And, and, and you had Caleb and Joshua that said, no, no, no. Yeah, they're big, but our God's bigger. Let's go, right? And so, so he thought the same thing was happening. He thought, man, we're on the, 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 the verge of going in and you want to opt out of the battle? 
You wanna let your brothers go to war? You wanna sit home on the beaches while your brothers are fighting and bleeding in the trenches? And they said, no, 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 Moses. It's not like that. We promise. That's not what we're trying to do here. We've got your back, Moses. We're going to go to war with you, and as long as you fight, we will shed blood with you. We will die with you. That's not what we're wanting to do. We have livestock, and there's great pasture land here. We're simply saying when we go, will you, when we, when we go and the Lord gives land, will you just let us come back here because there's great pasture land? We'll leave our families here. We'll come and fight with you. And Moses said, Okay, I mean, if you'll do that, the land is yours. But if you don't, God help you, right? And so uh, we know that that they went across. Then Moses died, Joshua took over. God brings them to Moab. They go across the river. Uh, you know, God holds it back. And they, man, they start with Jericho. And, and, and God, uh, over seven years, seven-year battle, they fight for seven years. God gives them the land. The land is now theirs. They, uh, they, they don't just, they're not just living in the land. They occupy the land. And, and Moses, or Joshua, I'm sorry, before he divides it up, uh, here, here's, here's what he says. Or after, as he's dividing it up, he, 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 he lets the, 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 the two and a half tribes go back to their home, and, 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 which is across the Jordan. That's why they're called the Transjordan tribes, okay? Now, here's where we learn some relational principles that I want to challenge you with. I wanna throw out there today that I think we see in this that I think we all need in our lives. And, and so some of these points you'll go, oh yeah, I need that in my life, or man, that you're strong in this area, okay? So, so let me go through them. The first thing we see, man, if we wanna have life-giving relationships that are deep, that, that last, uh, uh, you know, for the duration, uh, that, that, you know, when we turn around, man, uh, the people we know we got ride or dies because most people, we want ride or dies that we're created to want ride or dies. We're created to live in this courageous community with ride or die people, but most people feel like I don't have a lot of ride or die people. Most people feel like because of the disposable nature of everything, including relationships, that we can count on the number, uh, on one hand, the number of ride or dies that we have. Man, I want that, right? So how do I have that? Well, there's some things in here that I think are vital to having ride or dies. And so what are those? One, we gotta commend each other. You want to have a ride or die? You want to have relationships that are deep and lasting? We got to be commending each other, right? Uh, commendation is so huge. What happened was Joshua, before he sent them home, after he distributed the land, he looked at the two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, half tribe of Manasseh, and he said, hey guys, I want you to know, we read it a moment ago, I want you to know, you have been absolutely incredible. He said, you have done everything Moses commanded you to do. You've done everything I asked you to do. You have been loyal to, the, to, the, to your brothers. You have been faithful to the Lord. Bravo, two and a half tribes. Bravo. You have done incredible. Thank you for serving. Thank you for, for serving with us, for fighting with us, for bleeding and for dying with us, for being loyal, faithful to us and to the Lord. Bravo. He commended them. Man, he was like in front of, in front of everybody, he said, great job. He commended them, right? Listen, if we want to have long-lasting relationships, commendation is just a necessity in that, right? And it's so huge for our life. It's huge for our psyche. It's huge for uh, our attitude. It's huge for everything. I mean, for instance, let me give you some examples, right, about uh, just preaching in my life. Last week, man, Mother's Day was last week, and last week I'm, I'm out and the Mother's Day line for the photo booth, people were in line, and I was standing there close to the line, and, and there was a, a, a black family in line, and, and they looked at me, and they said, uh, Pastor, let, let me just tell you, if you're preaching one day, and a shoe comes flying up on the stage, that's not a bad thing. And I said, huh? And they said, man, in a black, I grew up in a black church, in a black church, man, it wasn't anything, if the preacher's preaching, and people's like agreeing and with him, man, they gonna throw a shoe on the stage. And I said, well, number one, that's good to know, <laughs> That's really, thank you for letting me know. And number two, man, throw them both, okay? I mean, don't just throw one, but man, slang them both up there. I mean, listen, that was so encouraging. They were commending me. That was just so encouraging. I, 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 I'll never forget that. It was just so encouraging, right? I mean, you know, and, and think about encouragement in preaching. I, I, you know, just from what I know, you know, when I'm preaching or anyone's preaching and they hear somebody say, amen, preach it. You know, I know that's right. When I, you know, you know, man, people are agreeing with me. I mean, you're picking up what I'm laying down. Man, that gets me wound up, right? I mean, that's encouraging. It's like, yeah, let's go, right? But I mean, think of the opposite. Man, if I'm preaching and somebody said, well, that's stupid, <laughs> which is not out of the question, I know, because I say some pretty stupid things sometimes. It's not out of the question. But if I heard, that's stupid. I mean, 
man, I wouldn't get wound up. I mean, I, I, I'd wind down and want to end this thing early so I can go home and crawl into a fetal position and suck my thumb, right? I mean, don't let that get any good ideas. Let's get him out of here early today. That's, that's stupid. That's the important, you know about it, man, when you're playing sports, if you're on the field or on the court, and, and, and man, and people's cheering your name, you know, versus heckling you, I mean, getting you out of your game, right? That's the importance of encouragement. And, and, and you know, I, I stand out every week and, <clears throat> and try to, and try to uh, greet guests, man. I love to greet guests and, man, people in the church that need to say, you know, man, tell me what's going on. I love to stand out there and greet guests. And, man, most of the time, I'm just telling you, man, when I'm standing out there, it's 99%. People are commending and people are encouraging. And that's awesome, right? Man, great job, preacher. I mean, I'm glad you preach the word. I'm glad you preach strong. I'm glad you preach cultural relative stuff and yada, yada, yada. And all. But every now and then there's a critic, right? There's a critic. And Sometimes it's deserved, all right? But every now and then there's a critic. There's a truth to most criticism, but every now and then there's a critic. But, and, and what happens is, is that's what you remember, right? You remember that. And, and, and so, I, I like, for instance, let, let, let me give you one from years past because I don't want to give a, 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 you know, a fresh one. Uh, but from, from years past, you know, I remember standing out there 20-some years ago and people would come by, man, great sermon, preacher, great sermon. That was awesome. And then, you know, every now and then you'd have somebody come by and say, preacher. I just, I mean, that's a good sign. I just don't know why you wear them old jeans. I think a preacher ought to wear a suit and a tie. I'm like, why do you think that? Well, it says in the Bible, we ought to wear our best. Oh, really? That's right, I pray with God helps those who helps themselves. Where, 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 where's that in the Bible, right? Well, I mean, we ought to give our best. I said, so hold on a minute. You think the Bible says you ought to wear your best in church? Yep. And, and you've got a 30-year-old polyester leisure suit that smells like mothballs on. Did you not know that that teenager's jeans that's got holes in them cost more than everything you've got on, including your shoes? <laughs> huh? I'm not bitter. <laughs> PTSD. But, uh, man, the importance of encouragement is so important. You know it takes 10 words of encouragement to overcome every negative word that we hear. Did you know that? And so that's important to know because, you see, here's what some people do. And I remember in my life thinking, sometimes you think, well, my daddy, he's always negative, or my coach, or my teachers. And sometimes that's fair and true because they literally are. Some people are just overcritical. You know who they are. Some, you know who you are if you're overcritical. Uh, I mean, that, they know who they are. But sometimes it's not fair because uh, it's just what we remember because, man, it's hard to get those out, even if deserved or not. It's hard to get those out of our mind. And so, so because that's the power of words. Let me, let me read you some, some scripture from Proverbs that, that uh, just literally tell us the importance of words. There is no one whose rash words, Proverbs 12, 18, there is one, I'm sorry, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, right? The words are powerful. Some people's words are like a sword thrust into your uh, uh, soul, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and healthy to the body, right? Proverbs uh, uh, 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. This tells us the power of words. We know that our words have power, and the Bible is very clear that our tongue and the power of our words is, is powerful. And, you know, we, we have to think about our kids. We have to continually correct our kids. I mean, if you want your kids to live, you're going to continually correct them, right? I mean, first off, I want you to live. Stop eating, you know, rat food, right? I mean, I, I want you to live. Don't get under the cabinet. I mean, so, so second off, I, I don't want you to just survive. I want you to thrive. And we know that kids have to be corrected. They have to be, they have to be corrected, and they ha we have to get on them. And so we continually do that necessarily, okay? So what we have to do is we have to find, intentionally look for ways to, to find them doing something right and praise them for it, right? I mean, hey, if it's, you know, you'll probably never look at your kid and say, son, thank you for cleaning up your room this morning. <laughs> Said no parent ever probably, right? But, you know, when your kid says, thank you, mom, hey, son, thank you for saying thank you. Th thank you for saying thank you. Thank you for taking the dog out. Thank you for whatever. I look for ways to say thank you. That was great so that you can intentionally praise them because you know within the next 10 minutes you're going to say, hey, stop doing that. Don't do that. Don't, you can't cut your sister's hair with a butcher knife, son. You're going to have to do that. So look for ways intentionally to 
to pray stuff. Think about, you know, your, your, your marriage. When you dated your wife, your husband, when y'all were dating, you probably, I mean, you were looking. You wanted to impress. You always were looking for a way to say, oh, that looks great. That's beautiful. I mean, thank you for doing it. You were wonderful. You looked for ways to do that, right? And man, then, you know, you, you look for ways to tell your wife, oh, I love that dress on you. I love those pants, all this kind of stuff. Then you get married and she says, hey, does these pants look good on me? And you're like, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you're faced with the, the, the dilemma all men face. Lie or be honest? How do I get out of this one? My point is you, you get married and all of a sudden you're like, you begin to find out and focus on what everybody does wrong right? You focus on, this is what they do that I don't like. And that's, that's where it can go. So you have to intentionally begin to, how can I praise my spouse? Thank you for your loyalty. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for, you know, what, what can you say to your spouse? You need to find something positive uh, every day. Thank you for this. Thank you for that to say to your spouse, to encourage, commend each other. If you want to go deep in relationships, we, we need to to commend each other, right? Think of the difference it'd make in your life if people, somebody told you once a day, if your boss told you once a day, if your spouse told you once a day, if your dad told you once a day, just at least one thing that you did right that day. At least one thing, the difference it'd make. Think about the difference it'd make in our church if all of us said we're gonna outdo each other in commendation. Man, I, and, and now I'm not, I'm not talking about inauthentic commendation. I'm not talking about, oh, uh, I want to say something. No, I mean, really getting to know somebody and saying, man, thank you for serving in our children. Thank you for, for, for serving in this area of our church. Thank you for doing this. Think of the difference it'd make in our church in your life if people done that to you. We want to have life-giving relationships. Commendation is so huge. And if you commend people genuinely, you, man, you will have friends, okay? Commendation. Here, here's what we see in Joshua for, for relationships within the body, the covenant community, as well as interpersonal relationships. Commend each other. They commended each other. The second thing we see is the balance to that, right? They, they confronted each other. They, this is where we don't like this, right? We don't like to be confronted, and we don't like to confront each other. But if we don't, I want you to understand our relationships will never go deep. If all we do is, if we remain in a sappy world, uh, our relationships will remain in a shallow world, in the shallow end of the pool. Uh, you want to go deep with people, you must be willing to confront and be willing to be confronted. That's what happened here. The tribes went home. Joshua sent them home. He commended them. He sent them home. And man, they go, they begin their careers. Everything's going great with them. Man, their careers are going great. They're they're, they're, they got livestock, man. They're, they're farmers, and they got livestock, and that's going great. Their land is good. They're back home with their families. And, uh, I mean, man, they got their families. They, got their, 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 they took home a bunch of wealth, it says. All the, the bounty and the booty from, from de- defeating all the cities is they went home rich. So they've got money. They've got land. They've got livestock. They've got their families. Things are going great with them. After seven years of war and, I mean, bleeding and and fighting, if they're at peace, things are great. And then all of a sudden, they realize there's got a problem. With all of our money and with all of our land and with all of our cattle and and livestock and and, and our families, we got a problem. We're isolated. We're isolated from our brothers. See, they lived on the other side. That's why they're called the Transjordan tribes. They lived on the other side of the Jordan, and you couldn't even get to the other uh, tribes much of the year because of the flood stage. They were isolated. And it's, they knew sort of like an ember, you know, that you take out of the fire and you put it over here on the hearth. Before long, that ember, it goes from glowing red because it's with its brothers, other brother wood in the fire. It, it, it goes dim and it goes out, right? And, and so, so they were isolated. And, and, and the rest of the tribes on the other side of the Jordan, they began to wonder, will, that, will, the, Ru, will the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, will they be loyal? Will, will they be loyal to the rest of the Israel? They began to wonder, hey, we're isolated. Will our kids even remember that we're a part of, 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 of uh, in solidarity with all of Israel? Will they even remember that? Will they remember our, how, how we're brothers in arms and how, how connected we are and how committed? Will they remember that? And, and, and the people on the other side of the river were like, man, I mean, I mean they, they, if, they, will, they, they thought the people on the other side of the river will, will They'll forget that we're part of them, and they'll cut us off. They'll say, man, you're on that side. All Israel's on this side, and, and it'll be bad. 
they, they, they began to think about how isolated they were. And so they, they come up with a solution. They said, we're isolated, and isolation's never good, folks. I promise, emotional isolation, physical isolation, it's never good. And so they, 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 they come up with a solution. They said, we're gonna build a big, huge altar, and we're gonna put it uh, on the river. And remember, earlier, they had built, when they went across the Jordan, when God had parted the Jordan, held it back, they got stones out of the, the river, set them up on the other side. So they built a huge altar on their side of the Jordan River, to show solidarity with their brothers. We want our kids to be able to remember, and we want to do this to show solidarity. Well, the other tribes on the other side, because they're isolated, they saw or heard about this altar, and they got angry. They got so angry, they were going to go to war and wipe the two and a half tribes off the face of the earth. And you're like, whoa, are you kidding me? That's an overreaction. Why why would they do that? Well, that's, that, that's a great question, and here's why they did that. Because Deuteronomy chapter 12, Moses had commanded the nation that you could only worship in designated areas. You could only build altars for sacrifice and worship in designated areas. This was not a designated area. This was an undesignated area, right? Moses did that so that the people uh, would, would remain unified in their worship. You can imagine if he just, people just go out and build altars wherever, go out and do your thing, then they could build an altar and they could syncretize different religions into that. It would, the, the, the fidelity to the Lord was in question. And so this was for the fidelity of the Lord and the unity of the community. You can only worship in these areas, right? This was not one of those. So they thought that the, the two and a half tribes that went home, man, and they were relaxing on their money Man, they, they had stacks of cash. They had good land. They had good livestock. They were sitting back, and they were drifting in their relationship with the Lord. Now that things are good, people tend to drift when things are good, more so than when things are bad, folks. And so they thought, man, things are good now. They're drifting in their relationship with the Lord. They went to worship other gods, and they're building an altar to this other god. And they're wor- they jumped to this conclusion, right, because they saw it. They knew it was undesignated. Why would they build an altar in an undesignated area if they were if they were walking with the Lord. And so, so they got angry. Why did they get angry? And why were they gonna wipe them from the face of the earth? Because they remembered two things it said. They remembered Peor. They remembered how, uh, how Israel had been enticed and God had said, you cannot intermarry with these other tribes because they don't know the Lord. Had absolutely zilch, zero to do with ethnicity or anything else. It was they worship ba- uh, Baal. They worship uh, uh, Astra, they worship all these other gods, and if you intermarry with them, they're gonna pull you down. So you marry Christians in our world today. You marry people that follow God. And, and, and so they fell in love with the Midianite women. They were enticed with the Moabite women. And, and so they fell into uh, relationships with them, and what did it do? Exactly what God said. It began to pull them away from the relationship with God, and 20, 25,000 people died as a result. They also remembered Achan. Remember Achan? God told them in Jericho, when you sack the city, you take zero. You take the gold and the silver for the treasury of the Lord, precious metals for the treasury of the Lord, but you take zero. Achan goes in and he sees some some gold and silver. It's enticing. Who's gonna know? It's just a little bit. It's just gonna help me and my family. And a little bit's not gonna matter. And he disobeys the Lord and he takes it. What happens? They go into Ai, such a small city, they can send a few, and they get routed, and people die. So they rem- that, so here's, let me tell you the conclusion they jumped to. They built this massive altar. It's in an undesignated place. It's not a designated altar. They're worshiping another god, and they're disobedient, and, God, and, and they knew that, that, that the sin of the sinner doesn't just affect the sinner, but everybody in the sinner's orbit. Remember Achan. People died because of his sin. Remember Peor. People died because people did what God told them not to do. We don't want God's judgment to come upon us because of the sin of one, because the sin of one affects the whole body, right? Your sin affects your family. Your sin affects those you work with. Your sin affects everybody in your orbit, folks. And they said, we don't want that to happen. They didn't want to suffer God's judgment because of the sin. They love their brothers on the other side, but they love their God more. Did you get that? They love their brothers, but they love their God more. Folks, let me say a couple things about this. First off, Oh, how I long and wish this were the case today. This kind of passion existed in the church, in the covenant community today. Oh, how I wish that people would look at their brothers and sisters, and when there was a question about what they were doing, when there was a gap, 
between what I know my brother or sister should do and what he or she is doing, and, and, and there's a gap between those two things, I, man, I, I go to my brother and sister and I confront them, right? That, that's what I, I, I long for that kind of passion for people to walk in fidelity to the Lord. I, there, there, you know, I think you would agree that America has suffered uh, from, for many years from what, we, what I call Christianity light, right? I mean, Christianity light. You know, it's not necessarily biblical Christianity. It's Christianity with a lot of moralism worked in and all this kind of stuff, but it's Christianity light. And in Christianity light, I think one of the reasons we suffer from that is because we will not do what we see the other uh, uh, nine and a half tribes do. We will not, we don't have that passion to confront when there's a gap between what someone should do and what they do. When we question whether someone's in sin, and, and it doesn't mean they always are as we see, but when there's a question, we don't go to people and confront them. We don't practice church discipline any longer in America, in American churches. Right? You know, church discipline, I know people look, church discipline, you mean you, you, you spank people in church? No. We don't, the Bible talks about church discipline. Church discipline is simply when a church member who's committed to a covenant relationship is walking in, in habitual sin, uh, you know, that, that man, we go to that and say, hey, what's going on? And the purpose of that is, is not to cast anyone out. It's for rest restoration. That's what church discipline biblically is when you read the New Testament. But churches stopped doing it long ago. Why? Because I might lose a church member. I don't want them to leave, and if I, if I confront them, if we confront them as a church, they, they may just bolt and go. I mean, for goodness sake, uh, that's why in the Bible Belt, there's a church on every corner. One of the reasons, not all the reasons, but one of the reasons, right? Uh, I mean, I had a preacher friend, a Canadian preacher friend who was a pastor in Canada, and he came down to do our youth camp a few years ago. He's driving through, man, driving through everything, and after he flew down, and actually he's driving around, he's like, I cannot believe. He said, Hood, I cannot believe and there is a church, I can throw a rock in any direction and hit four churches. He said, what I've been told is half of them's empty. Or, or, I said, yep. Yeah. He said, I, this is this place I, I wouldn't want to be. I'd rather be in Canada where I am. Where, I mean, I, man, and and, and the, the, the reason is, is there's a lot of church planning, which is good, but there's also been a lot of, oh, man, he, he, he's going to confront me. I'm going to go right over here. We're going to start a church right over here across the street, or, or, or I'm going to go down the street, or I'm going to go over here to this church. And we might lose them if we confront them. Listen, Friends don't confront friends anymore. Why? I might lose their friendship. Here's the thing that you need to understand. The question you need to be asking yourself is, what's more important to you, the friend or the friendship? It's a very important question. Do I care about this friend more than I do about this friendship, or do I care about the friendship more? It makes a big difference in what you're gonna do. Because if you care about the friendship, then you will not confront because you want to preserve that friendship. If you care about the friend more, you will confront because your main concern is preserving the friend. You get that? And so, so that's not what we see, and, and I believe it's contributed to Christianity light in, in our world because, well, man, we let our friends do things that, that they shouldn't be doing, and we, we don't say, hey. Now, when I'm talking about confronting, I'm not talking about going in with both cannons firing and both guns blazing. I'm talking about going in in love and saying, hey, you got this going on, or I see this can you explain this to me? What's going on? You know, the scripture says this, you know? Uh, and so that's what we should do. Now, the, here's the second thing we see in this. Now, the, the nine and a half tribes on the other side, they jumped to a conclusion. It was a logical conclusion, right? There was a gap between what the, the other two and a half people should do, which is remain faithful to the Lord and only build altars where there was a designated place. They didn't do that. So there was a gap between what they should do and what they did that created a gap so we're gonna fill in that gap with something. And so the other nine and a half tribes filled in that gap with, they jumped to the conclusion, they are walking away from the Lord. It was logical. Two plus two always equals four, right? It does. Two plus two will never equal five. Two plus two will never equal three. Two plus two will always equal four. Mathematical laws are, two plus two will always equal four. You can't change it. So they had a two, and they had a two, and then they had a four, okay? It was logical. Two plus two always equals four. But the problem is two is not always two. Sometimes that two might be a seven, and we didn't see the bottom line on that two. We don't see everything, and we don't know everything. So when we, we think two plus two equals four, 
We know two plus two equals four, but we might need to make sure there's a two there. How do you do that? You confront someone. You ask questions before you make accusations. That's what Jesus told us to do, right? I mean, Matthew chapter 18, it's one of the, the, the great passages for, for this. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother, this is the words of Jesus, by the way, all the words, God's word, this is the words Jesus spoke when he was on, on the planet. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Notice what he didn't say. This is the modern contemporary language translation. If your brother sins against you, man, you blaze him on Twitter and Instagram. Man, you talk about him on Facebook. You make sure everybody knows, right? That's the modern. Like, but here's what Jesus said. If your brother sins against you, go to him and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's what you go to that person when there's a gap. When there's a question, you go to that person. Hey, you go to him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. So you go to that person. Hey, I, did I see this? This is what I see. I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I, I see you treat, I, I see you, I hear you telling jokes that I don't think you should tell. What's going on here? Or I, I, I hear you making comments about women. Or I hear you talking to your wife. I, I, whatever it is, I, hey, man, I, I love you. I, help me understand because I, I want to help you here. This is something I see that it's a, it might be a blind spot in your life, and you're going to pull over, and you're going to get killed because you're going to get run over here, but, and you're not even going to know what hit you. So you go to someone. If they sin against you or if they sin, you go to someone, right? They jump to a conclusion. Hey, these people are walking away from the Lord. They're worshiping other gods. We're going to wipe them. They condemn them. We're going to wipe them from the face of the earth. Thank God cooler heads prevailed. And somebody said, let's send a delegate. Let's send a delegate to go confront them before we condemn them, okay? And so they did. They send a delegate, uh, a delegate. And when they, get over, when they get across the river, they're like, hey, guys, what are you doing? You've built an altar uh, in an undesignated place, and you know this is what Moses said in Deuteronomy 12. You can't do this. You're walking away from the Lord. What are you doing? A little bit like Moses saying, what are you doing? You're not going to go to battle. You're going to stay here on the beach while we go in the trenches. And they're like, no, 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 no. It's not like that, Moses. Don't, don't, don't jump to conclusion, right? He, and here, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's not like that, Venice. It's not like that. We, I promise, here's what we did. This is not a, an altar for worship. We're not going to offer sacrifices on this altar. This is an altar of solidarity with you. We love you. We are separated from you. We don't want our kids to forget you. We want you to know we're with you. And so this altar is an altar of unity and solidarity with you, right? I mean, it's, 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 this is all about Man, we're, we're with you. And when that happened, they were like, wow. Okay, so, so I had a misunderstanding, and misunderstandings happen. We know that. But they jumped to a conclusion, and it was a logical conclusion. That's why you ask questions before you make accusations. That's what God's people do. Ask questions before you make accusations. Right? You don't talk about each other. You talk to each other. There's three sides to every story, right? Your side, my side, and the right side. And so, so you, you go, and that's what happened. And, what, and when, when, they, when they were willing to confront, what did it do? It made their relationship stronger. See, we're, 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 we're afraid of confronting people because we're afraid it will destroy our relationships. We're afraid I'll lose the friend. It, listen, it, you, you don't really have a friend, okay? If, if, if saying, hey, I don't understand this. Let, explain this to me. That friend should know he cares, he cares about me enough to want what's best for me. Immediately, we get defensive. But then the relationship gets stronger. That's what happened here. They confronted them. The explanation was given, and they're like, oh, my goodness, man, we were wrong. And what happened? He said, man, the Lord is good. God was honored because they settled this difference the correct way. You want to have deep, long-lasting relationships, you've got to commend one another. But you want to have deep, long-lasting, life-giving relationships, we've got to be willing to confront one another within love, and then finally, man, we've got to be committed to each other. We've got to be committed to each other. People aren't committed to each other today. You know, we're, most of our relationships are transactional, right? I mean, you do something for me, I'll do something for you. I'll do this for you, 
because I, I, I want this from you. As long as you're doing something for me, I'm gonna do something for, that's a transactional relationship. Business, you understand it. The problem is, is we, we bring it into, it's mom, moms do it to kids sometimes, moms and dads. Kids do it to moms and dads. Husbands and wives with each other, right? You do this for me, I'll do this for you. I mean, and so it's transactional. And so, so that's not commitment to each other. That's as long as it's good for me, I'll do this for you. We need to be committed to each other. It's like I said, we live in a disposable world, right? I mean, man, people bounce and people go. And man, think about this. Think about uh, uh, your, your, I mean, your ride or dies, you would say today. Were they your ride or dies five years ago, 10 years ago? Most of us would say that some, one or two maybe. I mean, you think about, I graduated from high school a couple of years ago. Y'all flew right over y'all. When I graduated from high school a couple of years ago, I... Uh, you know, I, 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 man, we signed our, our, our yearbooks. Y'all signed, I don't, y'all still do that today. I don't know if you still, y'all still, you signed your yearbooks. And I mean, man, everybody was BFF. I mean, man, friends are friends forever, right? Everybody's BFF. Half the people said BFF. I never even seen them again. You know what I mean? I mean, I moved away. And I know things happen like that, but, but or, or, think about the commitment. We're committed to each other. But see, what we do now is we bail and, 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 and we set up our relationships in, 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 in the wrong, again, around the wrong thing, okay? If we're going to be committed to each other, I only believe that it can happen within the body of Christ. Let me tell you why. Everything else is, I mean, sometimes we build our relationships around sports. My kids are playing ball. My kids are playing travel ball. My kids are this. And so I'm, I'm at the park every weekend with these people and I'm, I'm practicing with these people, you know, my kids. So I see them a lot. And man, so that's, I, man, these are my friends, but your kid's not going to play ball next year or the year after that. That's going to fade. Those are going to fall. Man, it's around work. You're going to have a new job next year or the year after that. That's going to fade. That's going to fall. It's around passion. That's going to fade. That's going to fall. The only thing that lasts is the church, is, Jesus, is, is, is the people of God. And that's, what, that's the deepest relationships that you can possibly have is when they are anchored around Christ. It's the deepest relationships you can have. Are you committed to people in the community of Christ? Sadly today, people bounce around in that, right? Are you committed? Here's what I know. I, I know that, that I've been married for 20, uh, not 28 years. I've been here for 28 years. I've been married for 30-some years. I don't even, yeah. Thank you, but uh, I've been married for 30 some years. Now, let me make sure you understand. I could have bailed a long time ago. I was tempted to bail a long time ago. I know Amy was tempted to bail a long time ago. It would have been easy for her to, it would have been really easy for her to bail at any time along this way, because I know me. There's temptations along the way. We could have bailed. There was always something that, the grass always looked greener on the other side when, you know, I mean, uh, it, 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 in this time and that time. You, you know, if you've been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Here's what I know. I know that most people never get to experience the blessing of marriage because here's what I know studies reveal and here's what I know science reveals and here's what I know is real from living it. Marriage doesn't really get good until after 20 years of marriage. That's when it starts getting good. Everything gets better the longer you're married. The longer, you, do you know who has the greatest sex in marriage? It's not somebody on their honeymoon. Uh, it's not somebody in their first year of marriage. That's people that have been married for 20, 30, 40 years. According to research and study, it gets better. Everything gets better. Hey, that, that doesn't mean uh, we don't have problems. That, that, I mean, you, you know who Amy's married to. That doesn't mean we don't have problems. That doesn't mean everything's beautiful every day of the week. But I'm committed to that woman, and she's committed to me. And it would have been easy not to, but why? Because our commitment revolves around Christ, the gospel, and the word of God. And so I'm telling you what, man, I get the joy today because of that commitment of, of seeing the fruit. It would have been easy, to but I get the joy today of just absolutely having my five kids and our grandkids under the same roof and holidays and Mother's Day. What a blessing that is, man. I get the joy of having a wife that I know gets mad at me and, and, and sometimes for no reason, but she gets mad at me. And, 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 and man, she, you know, she'll tell me, I mean, man, she don't care to tell me 
uh, where I need to be sometimes and where to go sometimes. She don't care to tell me what for, but here's what I know. She has my back. I've got 30-some years of proof. I know where she's going to be. I know when we argue, I know she's not walking out the door. I've got 30-some years of proof. I've got a security. Man, I, 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 I am living, I, I mean, man, the blessings of the commitment, and there's many times when I could have bailed, and the blessings of that commitment are absolutely innumerable. I've been here for 28 years, 28 years. I look around at some of you, and you were here when I came. I've been here 28 years, and most of you never thought I'd have been here that long. I never thought I'd have been here that long. I, I mean, to be quite honest with you, there were many times I wanted to bail. There were many times I wanted to get out of Dodge. There have been some hard times along that way. You can't lead without there being hard times. Uh, just like a marriage, there's been many times, and let me be, be quite honest with you, there are many times where I had the opportunity to go. There are many times where I had the opportunity to go make more money. The grass was greener, right? And man, I had some issues over here, and the grass was greener, and it would have been easy to bail. But man, let me make sure you understand, I'm committed. There's about three reasons why I would ever leave my church. There's only three reasons that I know that I would ever leave my church. And I think they should be everybody. But let me make sure you understand. One, if I die, okay? I mean, I'm going to move out of the country at that point, right? I'm, I'm going to have, now y'all can stuff me and put me up here like this right here. I'd love that, right? <laughs> but I won't be here. That's one reason. I'm moving, <laughs> okay? The second reason is if the Lord legitimately called me. If I felt the Lord telling me, Pat, I need you, I've need, i got a new assignment for you, and I knew that the Lord was telling me that, then we would all know it, and listen, I, I, I'm going to do what the Lord tells me to do. I don't ever want that to happen. I, I hope the Lord leaves me here till I retire, but if the Lord called me, and you know what I would do if that happened? Well, you wouldn't just show up to church one Sunday and wonder, where's Pat? I mean, where's Pat? Well, I don't know. I ain't seen him in a month now. I wonder where he went. Oh, I saw on Facebook, he was pastoring over here in Georgia now. He didn't even tell us. That's so sad. I, no, 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 that would be a process, right? That would be something. I, it would know the Lord's calling me, and, and that would be an explanation, which is what should happen with anyone who ever is called somewhere. And there's a third. So one is I die. Or, which would be moving, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, if I die, or, or you know, would move away for, for uh, uh, and the only reason I would move away is if the two, the Lord legitimately called me, and he would never call me away from here, from running from it. He would always call me to something, okay? Man, if I'm leaving running from something, it's hard for me to decipher if the Lord's calling me or if I'm running. But if the Lord's calling me to something, then, man, it's going to be obvious. That's the second thing. And the third thing is if the pastor ever started preaching heresy, I know him pretty good. I promise you that ain't going to happen. Okay? So, so that is, that's the three reasons that I could think of that I would ever go bail. I'm committed. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes you people are hard to manage. You know that. Sometimes I'm hard to manage. You definitely know that. Sometimes on Monday morning, I go home, I come into office, and I'm like, man, I, anybody, any of my pastor friends know me jobs? Sometimes I go in on Monday morning, and I'm like, this is the sweetest place on earth. Sometimes I go home, and I'm like, anybody got any wives I can marry? And sometimes I'm like, this is the sweetest woman on earth. That's relationships, right? But I'm committed. Let me tell you, as a result of being committed, let, let me make sure you understand what I get the blessing of enjoying. I get the blessing of looking up today and the three people who are singing on stage, Zion, Jordan, and Anna, grew up in our church. And I get to see that. I get to see the fruits of a ministry. I get to see kids baptized, and I get to baptize kids whom I baptized their mom and dad when they were kids. Man, you talking about a blessing? That is absolutely amazing. I, I, I get to stand up here on Mother's Day, and I have a, a, a senior reading scripture in his cap and gown, 
And, I, and his mom, that later that day, sends me a picture of when he was dedicated and I'm holding him as a baby when he was dedicated. And now he's reading scripture beside of me as he graduates. I'm thinking, man, thank you, Lord. What blessing for letting me see the fruit of years of ministry. I get to look out and I get to see some of you guys that when times are bad, when times have, when we've gone through bad times, some of you guys in here, man, you literally had my back. And not only did you have my back, you got in front of me. It's always easy for people to say, I got you back, preacher. And I'm like, great. The airs are coming from the front. Will you get somebody get in front of me too? <laughs> you know? And I got the privilege of knowing who I can trust. And no one has, I've got relationships that I've got ride or die that I know that man's integrity. And some of those same, and, and those same people, let me make sure you understand, those same people that's had my back for all those years, sometimes they've had to get in my face. Sometimes they've had to get in my face. Man, that makes relationships sweet. That makes relationships lasting. Those are lasting ingredients. So here, here's what I, I want to ask you, folks. Are you, man, as, as we get, as, as uh, Zion and Jordan and Anna Grace and our band come back up, here, here's what I want to ask you today. I'm, I'm not going to make a huge plea to, man, come down to the altar and pray and all that stuff. And I, you can always welcome to do that. Here's what I want to simply ask you. Who do you need to come in today? Who do you need to, to, to come in today? I, I know we need to come in to our family, our kids, our husband, our wife, our parents. Who do you need to come in? Who do you need to catch and say, hey, thank you for what is it? I don't know. Thank you for this. Who do you need to come in? Maybe you need to write somebody a note. Maybe you need to send somebody an email. Maybe you need to send somebody a text. Maybe you need to call somebody. Maybe you need to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Maybe you need to get up in the middle of the serve or in the, while we're singing and go across to somebody and say, man, I just want you to know I am thankful for your faithful friendship. I am thankful I can trust you. I'm thankful you got my back. You might want to do that during worship. That's fine. Praise the Lord. God's honored, man. That's the response. Who do you need to come in today? The second thing I will ask you is, who do you need to confront today? Is there anybody you need to confront? Do you have any friends that, man, what they should be doing and what they do is not matching up and there's a gap? It might be two plus two equals four and you might be saving your friend a world of trouble or it might be a seven instead of a two and it really doesn't add up and they'll tell you and you'll go, okay, great. And then that friend will know either way, uh, they love me enough to confront me. They love me enough to want what's best for me. Then your relation, who do you need to confront? Hey, and when I ask that question, just understand, you may be the one that someone else needs to confront. Okay, and so when they do that, don't get so defensive that you don't listen. If, if you need to be confronted, the greatest thing to do is confess and repent. And, and if you don't, explain the situation and thank someone for loving you enough to confront you. And the second thing, the third thing I would ask you is, are you committed? Are you committed to the covenant community? Are you committed to people in your church? Are you committed? I, you can be committed to a lot of people, but let me tell you something. The, 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 you want to have deep, long-lasting relationships, it's got to be in the covenant community. Are you committed? And we got D groups. We've got life groups. You call us. You go out to the booth. We'll help you plug in and find one, I promise. Okay, we got service groups. We got multiple ways for you to plug in. We want to be sticky for you. We want you to come and stick. How can we help you do that? So I'm gonna pray, and when I get through praying, we're gonna all stand and sing, and when we're doing this, I just want you to be thinking, Lord, who do I need to come in? Do I need to confront someone? Maybe someone needs to confront me. Maybe you need to confront yourself first. Uh, or, or, am I committed? These are three questions that you need to roll over in your mind. But here's the, here's the greatest thing of all. We talk about these relationships, these friendships. Where do we get all this? Who's the model friend? Jesus. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus ever give up on you? Did Jesus ever betray you? No, Jesus hung to the end on the cross. When we betrayed him, he didn't betray us. He went the distance. He, he, he never gave up. He went the distance, sacrificial love, and died on the cross after living a perfect life so that we could have a relationship with him. And the only way our relationships with others will be better, do you know him? First thing some of you need to do today is surrender to Jesus. We would love to help you know how to do that. If you're online watching, just text the word Jesus to the number on the screen, 1-615-551-9800. Or 
uh, if you're in the room, you can come and talk to us at the Connect booth, and we'll be glad to help you to understand how to enter into a relationship that will set all relationships. Let's pray right now, please. Father, we love you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for the word that you give us. Thank you that your word is so powerful and so strong. Thank you that your word deals with everything. God, it's very doctrinal. It tells us what to believe. And Lord, some sermons that I preach are very doctrinal in nature, which is huge because what we believe determines how we behave. But God, thank you that other messages are very practical in, in, in essence, Lord. And I think the message today that we see is so practical in how the whole nation of Israel, Lord, that they were willing to commend and confront and be committed to each other in a way, God, that honored you. And Lord, in a way that gave them life. I pray for that kind of community, courageous community within our church and within our covenant community called Life Point. God, I pray that today you would save someone. I pray that today someone would look at you and go, I need Jesus. And the only way that the relationships horizontally will be good is if the relationship vertically with you is good. And I pray that today many would enter into relationship with you. We love you. We praise you. We, Lord, those who know you, I know with me right now, acknowledge that you're God. I pray that those who don't would love you and praise you and acknowledge that you're God today. Lord, I pray you would be honored in our relationships and we would go deep with each other, that we would go long haul with each other so that we could honor you in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all 